although animal advocates put the animals first, the non-human animals first, humans are animals too, and we need to think of each other and the things that we need in order to function well as people first and as advocates. This is Defender Radio. I'm Michael Howie, and this is Defender Radio, the podcast for wildlife advocates and animal lovers brought to you by the Fur Bearers. Animal advocacy is a huge community. There's folks like us at the Fur Bearers who focus on wildlife coexistence, habitat issues, and a specific commercial issue. There's groups like Coyote Watch Canada or the North Shore Black Bear Society who focus on specific wildlife Then there's groups who focus on farmed animals, domesticated animals, vegan principles, international policy, local policy, and more. In short, it's a huge community. As such, when we ask the question, how you doing, animal advocates? The response is a collective blurring of various voices. That is until you bring in the researchers. Faunalytics is a nonprofit that does research, maintains a research library, and directly supports advocates and organizations. In one of their latest projects, they took on the rather large task of figuring out the experiences of animal advocates in English-speaking North America, Canada, and the United States. This is important work. It creates a reference point for future inquiries, shows advocacy organizations where we must improve, and highlights the absolute need for amplifying the voices of and reach to marginalized groups within the animal advocacy community. Dr. Joe Anderson, Faunalytics Research Director, joined Defender Radio to explore the study, the need for asking these questions, how to interpret the data, and what solutions we can seek to improve the animal advocacy community, not just to be successful for the animals, but to be good to each other. And stay tuned after the interview to find out about some new merch I'm giving away and how you can win it. If you're an animal lover, and I'm pretty sure you are, you may also love Animal Stone. This family-owned jewelry company, located in Canada, uses ethically sourced metals, including recycled materials, to make absolutely stunning animal-inspired charms and jewelry. What really stands out to me is the detail and character in every animal, from the curious fox, whose purchase supports Sandy Pines Wildlife Center, to Farnham the frog, who looks ready to leap off a leaf and into your heart. Head over to AnimalStone.com or follow Animal Stone on social media to see their unique charms and show the world your love of animals. And if you use promo code Defender Radio, you'll save 10%. That's AnimalStone.com and use promo code Defender Radio. So to start, let's talk about the intent behind this study. It's it's a, as seems to be the, the way of faunalytics, a big swing to take on this project. So how do you how do you come up with the, I guess, the conversation that leads to starting to ask these questions? Oh, that's such a good question. And I love that way of putting it. <laughs> we, by the nature of our organization, we have advocates from a huge range of different backgrounds and cause areas. Uh, we have people who are doing farmed animal advocacy um, in terms of individual outreach, who are doing institutional advocacy, who are working with wild animals, wild animals in captivity, animals used in research. Um, Pretty much every kind of advocacy is represented among our audience. I think that's how we end up in these big swing kind of scenarios Mm -hmm. in terms of the studies. We want to do things that are going to be applicable to as broad a range of advocates as possible so that they can have a lot of impact in all different cause areas. So the conversation that led to this particular study was essentially what do we know about why advocates stay in or leave the movement and i say the movement but just talking about all the different cause areas it's so obvious that really there is no singular organism that is the animal advocacy or animal protection movement it's really a conglomeration of all kinds of different movements but in order to tackle that Uh, you have to do a pretty big study. And we got into this trying to figure out not just why people leave the movement or an organization, but more broadly, what kind of experiences they have um, and whether that depends on different things about the advocates themselves, where they're working, whether they're paid or not paid. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, all kinds of things. 
And you certainly have gotten some very interesting results from it. Uh, the one thing I wanted to touch on, uh, as we discussed beforehand, is what we knew going in. Because there is some information I'm, I'm willing to guess that you had at least insight into already, particularly regarding some things like mental health, um, the high, the general high turnover in the industry, etc. Yeah, exactly. I think, as far as I know, this is the first attempt at a really comprehensive, large-scale quantitative study, trying yeah. to put numbers to things. But there's been a lot of research uh, that's qualitative, like interviews with advocates, uh, first-hand first -hand accounts from advocates, talking about things, particularly, like you said, in the realm of mental health, burnout, uh, discrimination, when AR Me Too started happening. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of research, but it's kind of piecemeal and not putting everything together in one big swing, again, as you put it, because yeah. that's so difficult to do. So we wanted to take a shot at that and start putting some numbers to things to move the research in that direction. It's not a one-step process, but it's hopefully the first step. Absolutely. And the first step is figuring out how to do it. Methodology. I always bring this up because I don't always get it as a non-scientist. <laughs> uh, and as I also explained in the... the uh, email I sent over uh, to your team. I have personally noticed as a media person since 2016, uh, people are much more willing to dismiss studies in the media than they used to be, particularly survey style studies uh, and polling. And I, in my opinion, that is in part because the media really tried to quickly do a lot of work and failed. Uh, in a rather spectacular way that did not doom the world to four years of hell. Um, we're not political here, so no, no. we'll just be clear <laughs> about that. Uh, so how, how do you go about this? What, what are the steps to asking these questions and assembling the data in a way that's usable? Absolutely. So... I could talk about methodology all day. I'm super happy you asked about it. <laughs> Feel free to cut, cut me off at the point when I become, become boring. Because um, I think a lot of the issue with this kind of thing is that the scientists who are doing the research usually know a lot about the One hopes know a lot about the methodology mm -hmm. and could write a lot on it, often do. But there's only so much that you can convey in a media version of the piece. And some of those details are lost. Sometimes they're important details. So I don't want to put any blame on the media for the mm -hmm. 2016 election, if if that might have been what you were referring to, possibly. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so in this particular case, the difficulty we faced, the primary difficulty with the methodology is the population. Mm -hmm. So when you go into something like election polling, you know who the population of interest is. It's everyone in the United States in that case, or in Canada in our case. Um, and then your difficulty is contacting a random representative sample of people within that population. So with polling, you'll usually do something like random digit dialing, um, or if it's a little bit more cost effective type of polling that you need to do, you can build a sample that you know has the same general demographics as the population that you're interested in. Mm -hmm. So uh, for instance, you get a certain number of people of each gender, you get people in different age ranges, races, economic backgrounds, um, and build a sample that, while much smaller than your population, represents it well. So that's other types of research. In this case, animal advocates, there is no census of animal advocates in any country, and there probably never will be. Um, it's not something that governments care enough about to be bothered doing. So the, big, the biggest issue that we have is trying to understand who the population are that we're describing. I don't know uh, how many animal advocates there are in Canada or the US. Um, and even as I say that, you can probably think of other issues like how people self-define. Are they an animal advocate? Are they not an animal yep. advocate? So what you'll often see in cases like this where the population is hard to define, that A, either there's no quantitative research at all, which has been largely the case in this area. Or you'll see um, convenience samples where people just send surveys to anyone they can get, any method that they can, 
um, you know, posting it on social media, sending it to friends, just kind of throw your hands up and say, well, we don't know what the population is, so there's nothing we can do about it. And that's not something I would advocate for. <laughs> so <laughs> as you can probably guess, yes. uh, that leads to very difficult to interpret results. So what we did in this study um, was a method called respondent driven sampling, where people who participate uh, complete the study and then refer it to other people that they know. And you may have heard of something similar called snowball sampling that works like that. Mm -hmm. But the difference with respondent driven sampling is that it's very controlled. So snowball sampling, you just kind of tell people here, here's our survey, send it off to others when you're done. Um, in this case, we track anonymously, not by name, um, using respondent ID numbers, exactly who is recruiting who else, and you cap the number of referrals that they can do. And uh, apologies if this is getting too technical, but no, it no, lets I... you... you go ahead. I was gonna say I, I want to know. That's that's why you ask the questions. <laughs> Great. Um, so the the really big plus of that is that it prevents you from getting huge clusters of very similar people that you can get easily when. The researcher sends it to a few people that they know. One of those people happens to be very well connected. You know, I send it to you, for instance, and you have all of these media contacts and people you've interviewed. You might get a huge number of participants for me, which seems great on paper, except just sort of logically speaking, they're going to be more similar to you than the average member of the population. Sure, yeah. yeah. So this is the method that we used. Um, tracking these referral change, the, referral chains, they're called, uh, where people send it out to others and we can see kind of how far it gets down each of these chains, how many people along. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we got with this was closer to representative than you would get with a convenient sample, but I'm not going to tell you that it's perfect by any means. Um, what I would say with a study like this is that the numbers that we got, the results are good evidence of trends that are occurring in animal advocacy, but don't look at a number like 33% and say 33% is the exact number of animal advocates who think this. Yeah. You know, there's always a range around it. And in this particular study uh, with this methodology, which is the best we can do at this time, um, it's a little fuzzier than your average study even. Absolutely. And I, I was thinking of the the way you phrased it, that not everyone will identify as an advocate and how true that is, because uh, I will make the argument that being vegan is advocacy. Whether or not you're going out and doing anything else or speaking outward, the very act of it is a type of advocacy. Um, so that alone could throw such a huge skew into how that whole thing goes down. It's it must, I, I don't know, I, I just imagine a lot of you sitting around with like scattered coffee cups and papers all over a table debating axis and curves and whatnot um, <laughs> as you apart, decide how to do this. Apart from the fact that we all work remotely, not at one table, <laughs> that's, that's, that's pretty accurate. Yeah, there's so many decisions that go into it, trying to figure out how to define it, who to, you know, who to cut out, like you, you can't think of absolutely every person in there at the same time or it yeah. gets too difficult to generalize so you have to make a cut somewhere and what we did in this study was define it as people who are actively advocating in particular ways that involve working with a group or going out and doing something mm -hmm. um, so in this particular case it would not include people who are just quote unquote vegan even yeah. though I agree with you there is a degree of advocacy to that just by nature of the fact that the people around you are seeing you mm -hmm. be vegan. Absolutely. So it's uh, a decision. It's also, it's also interesting because it sounds a little bit like talking about baseball. Um, just, just to throw another skew into this homogenous <laughs> yeah. group we're talking about, I'll bring up sports. Um, uh, no, it's, anyways, I've been watching baseball again, so I've got all that talk in my head and it's that <laughs> same kind of, discussion over stats sometimes which is interesting yeah uh, uh the key findings away from professional sports and back into advocacy <laughs> more my area of expertise uh -huh. i think that's true of most of the audience that's okay um so there there are several key findings that are published in this report um but let's just go over those so the first one is that generally speaking 
Um, as, as it's written across all measures, majority of advocates felt satisfied and supported in most aspects of their work for animals. Um, now, I, I must say, as a journalist, all of the little qualifiers in there jump out at me. So almost all measures, majority felt in most aspects. Uh, yeah. So is that, again, it's it's that safety net of how do you describe this sort of moving target of people? Yeah, and, well, and it's also just that there is no average advocate, right? Yeah. We end up talking about averages all the time, but there are people in this study who are 100% satisfied with every aspect of advocacy and couldn't say a negative word about it. And there are other people who have had the exact opposite experience. So the only way to make broad statements is to say things like most advocates, most measures, mm -hmm. most of the time. Um, and what I mean by that basically is across all the measures we looked at, so things like leadership, job resources, discrimination and harassment, more than half of the people in the study uh, said that they were at least somewhat satisfied or that they agreed in a positive way with the items. Um, it doesn't mean that every person in the study was 60% satisfied or 75% satisfied, obviously. Uh, but it is good to know, generally, there is a positive attitude across the study findings. That I, I would yes. presume that's the takeaway from that first point. That is the takeaway, especially because the rest of the report is very focused on seeing where the rooms for rooms where the room for improvement is mm -hmm. and how we can do better it's very easy to read the rest of the points and think oh geez there are so many issues so i really wanted to put up front the fact that hey overall people are not unhappy this is not a doom and gloom scenario um that said we do need to take into account all of the other findings that do point out those ways that we can improve as a movement uh and we move into immediately why animal advocates have left organizations um <laughs> And again, when I look at this, I sort of, I sat and I thought about it and I realized that's got to be close to true for most jobs though. Uh, so when we look at why people left, we see 40% um, uh, of people over leadership issues, finding a better opportunity was over a third, um, not wanting to do this particular type of advocacy anymore is over a quarter at 27%, burnout uh, 21%, um, so one in five they're they're like that does not sound necessarily particular to advocacy to me that sounds like you could apply that to a lot of job careers or a lot of interests uh or, or opportunities in that way and maybe see similar results yes i think you're right um it's a little bit hard to directly compare and i have tried uh, <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> to look at other other areas but most of the the data on turnover and satisfaction within an organization comes from the organizations themselves ah. so they tend to report things in a bit of a different way i don't know that i've seen leadership mentioned as a problem in those types of reports they'll say they'll say better opportunity or yeah. not wanting to do that kind of work anymore for sure um but the focus tends to be a little bit different. So that said, I completely agree. And I actually think that in a way, this might be one of the surprising findings to some advocates, how much of advocacy turnover is not about advocating for animals or that particular type of work. It's just about being a person in a job and the professional demands of the role mm -hmm. or the other demands, the leadership troubles that people have, um, all those things that are just about being a human in a work environment. Absolutely. And that's actually something we'll be talking about in a soon to come episode. I'm talking with Liz Sinclair Kruth again, who is a former ER vet who is now a therapist. And we had a great conversation a couple of years ago about burnout. We're going to talk about some of that again soon. Um, but that's certainly something I want to bring up with her. And I think, again, from a, a, a professional standpoint, those of us who do this full time, at five o'clock, I'm going to go outside and work on a wood project while yeah. listening to a podcast. That's the end of my day. Uh, it's not continuing to do this work. Uh, yeah. I'm fortunate, and I think many of us will agree, that I get to combine my work with something I'm passionate about. But realistically, at the end of the day, I need to walk away from this computer and all of the things I've looked at on it for a few hours. 
I completely agree. I will be leaving to go play Dungeons and Dragons at the end of the day today. Nice. And it's it's the same idea that it's great that we can turn it off in that way if that's what we need at the time. Um, but that is the reason that we saw to get to a result for a second is that uh, amongst our sample, the advocates who are paid um, actually experience more of those burnout, traumatic stress, work-life balance issues than the ones who are unpaid, which in a way might seem a little counterintuitive because probably the people who are putting in time as volunteers are spending more time on quote unquote work overall during the week mm -hmm. between whatever their day job is and advocacy. They're probably putting in more hours total, but the really difficult emotional work of being an advocate is much lower than it is for someone who is doing this full time. There is a sense of responsibility that's difficult to assign to it, I think, but that's a, a philosophical conversation, which is qualitative, not quantitative. Um, <laughs> yes. See me using science terms there? Huh? <laughs> there you go. Thanks. Um, but we were going to talk about the difference. Uh, uh, thank you for bringing up that segue between some of the unpaid and paid. Uh, one of the things I was wondering about is the ratio. What did you come across? Like how is there some way of identifying Overall, in North America, at least, which is your your demographic you're looking at, um, is there some idea of the ratio of unpaid versus paid, or is that just a, a complete pie in the sky question I'm asking that you can't answer with this study? I wish I knew. It is one of the things that we had hoped with this methodology to be able to figure out, mm -hmm. but what we found, um, looking closely at the methodology itself, is that people who were paid were more likely to respond to the study. Mm. So that's why you see in the results that throughout most of the report, we've split it into paid advocates versus unpaid because there were differences between them. And because we saw that they were more likely to respond, which makes sense, they they have more time and uh, you know it's potentially part of their job yep. to be doing this. Um, because of that, we can't say that the ratio we saw in the sample is the same as the ratio you see in quote unquote real life. Yeah. Uh, and I strongly suspect that unpaid advocates are underrepresented in our study, that there should have been a lot more of them to bring it up to what you would see in the population of the U S or Canada. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, yeah, at this time, there is no way of knowing exactly what the true ratio is. I just think that it's, if anything, Probably there are more unpaid advocates than paid, which yes. is the opposite of what we saw in this sample. Yeah, I think that's a reasonable conclusion. Um, yeah. and, and as we're going to go through this, so this this next section of the key findings was about retaining paid animal advocates. Um, and I'm just, could you explain how this point kind of plays out? Because I, I don't want to misrepresent anything in it. Yeah, so this is something that we did statistically looking at correlations between current levels of satisfaction with various aspects of being an advocate and intentions to leave the movement. So we asked people to reflect on whether they thought it was likely that they would leave the movement within the next year and correlated that with uh, other things that they had reported on, like the demands of their advocacy role or their satisfaction with the leadership at their organization. And to sum up all of them, because there are a number on the list, um, basically what we found is that paid animal advocates who generally work for organizations need those things that we were talking about, just the, the positive aspects of being a human in a job. You need a rewarding professional environment uh, with reasonable demands, leaders who are communicative and fair and support you. You need other supports from your peers and colleagues. And you need to feel that you're making a difference and hopefully aren't experiencing burnout. Mm -hmm. All of those positive aspects of working for an organization. And um, you you did note that majority of paid advocates are satisfied with those, but there is room for improvement on all of them, which is something of a reflection of the, the first point you wanted to get in, which is sort of on average, people are satisfied. Exactly, exactly. And I would also say we didn't do this study by organization. We did it at the individual level yeah. and we didn't ask people to identify their organization because there was a lot of sensitive information in this study and we didn't want them to feel that their confidentiality was in jeopardy. So 
I can't tell anyone reading the results whether their organization has problems in these areas or not. That is for organizations to look at themselves and get feedback from their employees and their volunteers whether they do have difficulties in these areas. And I'm guessing that a lot of them, uh, especially those who have been called out previously, already know whether they have problems or at least suspect whether they have problems in some of these areas mm -hmm. and can think about whether they're in that room for improvement category. <laughs> It's very gentle. <laughs> uh, one of the notes too, I'd just like to point out again, is up to one quarter are experiencing compassion fatigue, which can include burnout, traumatic stress. Um, and I think for tr up to 25% of paid advocates to self-identify as experiencing some degree of that likely means there are more experiencing it uh, without identifying it. That's my unprofessional guess. That's my professional guess as well, because again, the way the methodology worked, we found that people who are privileged in various ways were more likely to respond. So paid advocates were more likely to respond, um, but we also had difficulty getting the study to enough uh, people who are lower paid or uh, people of color, especially black advocates, were less likely to respond than others. And I think that's just a reflection of the additional stress stresses that are on marginalized advocates. So all of these things, I suspect, are higher, the negative things, I suspect are higher in real life than we saw in this study. I would think that burnout is higher. People who are experiencing burnout have less time to complete a survey. Yeah, so. this is true. <laughs> yeah. um, or feel they have less time. As is yeah. the case. Um, yeah. uh, and again, I, I, I absolutely encourage anyone who is feeling overtired or any of the other apathetic type sensations of burnout or compassion fatigue to please reach out to someone, anyone, and talk about it. And we will have more on that in an episode coming up soon. Uh, before we dive into the underrepresentation of some communities, which I think is vital in this conversation. I did want to look at these last couple of points. Um, so looking at unpaid animal advocates retention, mm -hmm. very reflective of the paid just with the paid portions removed. Yes. <laughs> yes, they were. Um, so how, how satisfied they were with the organization's leadership was important for unpaid advocates as well, as you would expect. Mm -hmm. Um, and the one that I thought was particularly interesting for unpaid advocates is that it really mattered to them how much they identify or feel a sense of belonging with other animal advocates. Because if you're in a role as an unpaid advocate, you want to feel that you're making a difference. But another huge part of that is feeling that you fit in in the community you're involved with, in the organization you're involved with. You're not The reward you're getting is not pay. Yeah. I mean, for all of us, it's hopefully the feeling of doing something that you're helping animals. But in addition to that, for unpaid advocates, it's how much they feel like they fit in and identify with that community. And the third point on that one, which leads nicely into the next two points, was whether or not, it's almost like you knew what you were doing when you wrote this, eh? Uh, whether or not they had experienced harassment. For the purposes of the the rest of this conversation, uh, harassment, bullying, or abuse comes up. Uh, and it's sort of summarized as harassment. How do we define harassment for the purposes of the study and the rest of the conversation? Absolutely. Super important question. And we defined it in a few different ways in the study. We gave them different checkboxes to start with just to kind of set the the framing of this issue um, and asked about whether they had experienced unwanted sexual attention, sexual harassment, or sexual violence. Um, other verbal abuse is another, uh, which in includes things like slurs or contempt, humiliating behavior, threats, um, or other physical violence. So spitting, hitting, shoving, or other forms of harassment. So it was as inclusive as we could make it, giving examples of different things and including both verbal and physical, sexual and non-sexual. Um, and we didn't want to get into the really super technical definitions that you'll see in government documents. It was meant to feel a little more accessible to the average person who has experienced this kind of thing. So the, the next two points talk specifically about harassment, uh, bullying, as well as discrimination. 
before we get into discrimination, which deserves its own area of this interview, um, you note that 13% of unpaid advocates had experienced at least one incident of harassment, bullying, or abuse from other advocates or members of the public. Um, what, what does this then mean? Is this something that is a higher number for unpaid advocates versus paid advocates? Is this something that's higher or misrepresented in animal advocacy versus other, you know, areas or other industries? What do we know from this information you've collected? So first it's, important to note what the time frame is for that 13%, which is over the past five years. Okay. I'm also glad that you noted that it was both other advocates and members of the public. It also included uh, groups like funders, people from other advocacy organizations, not necessarily your own. Um, so it was meant to be as broad as possible because all different forms of harassment or bullying or abuse um, can really influence your experience as an advocate. So that's what the 13% is for unpaid advocates. And that's compared against 27% of paid advocates who had experienced harassment. Um, so it was lower for unpaid than paid. Um, but we think that the reason for that is not something that's qualitatively different about being a volunteer as opposed to a, a paid advocate more just the time spent that yeah. again, there's so many more hours put in per week by paid advocates that they are exposed to so many more situations just by virtue of that, that that's really the source of these differences. One of the parts of this that really jumped out at me and I'm very, very glad and grateful that Faunalytics included this is looking at discrimination and harassment, specifically looking at LGBTQ plus advocates, uh, people of color, um, black, indigenous people, it, there is a clear disproportionate, disproportionate impact on marginalized groups across the board on issues. So I'm just going to turn that over to you to because I can't ask a smart question at this point, but <laughs> what did we learn? What What is the, the sort of the highlight of that section? Because I really think this is important for us to get out. Highlight or low light, depending on how you look at it. Very true. Yes. Um, yes. Discrimination and harassment were more common for advocates who are members of any marginalized group. And I do want to make the point that while we didn't have the numbers in this study, just enough sample to look really closely at things like members of multiple marginalized groups, mm -hmm. all evidence from other areas suggests that you know, black women, for instance, are going to suffer that much more discrimination and harassment than a white woman yeah. or a black man. Um, they're cumulative. So, but what we see across all different marginalized groups, including race, gender, ethnicity, disability status, um, all of those groups were disproportionately likely to experience uh, harassment. So, for instance, Again, our numbers were really small. And so from a methodological standpoint, I do want to make the point, we can't say for sure how these generalize, but half of advocates with disabilities in this study reported that they had experienced discrimination or harassment on the basis of being disabled. Mm -hmm. uh, about a third of women and non-binary advocates had experienced it on the basis of their gender. Advocates of color was close to a third as well. Um, LGBT Q plus advocates were a little luckier, I suppose, 14% um, there, uh, but they're certainly not numbers that we want to see for any of these groups. Mm -hmm. And there's clearly an issue with discrimination and harassment for marginalized advocates in particular. And that's something that we as organizations have to accept as a truth and now deal with. Um and the next question, and I don't know if you can answer this, but I'm going to throw it out to you anyway. How do we deal with it? Are there solutions to be found in the questions you asked? Well, one of the biggest sources of harassment, bullying, and abuse was managers within people's own organizations. So I'd say that points pretty clearly to where things need to start. And that is always going to be the case. People with power are the ones who have the need to make the most change. Mm -hmm. Whether they think they're a part of the problem or not, they are the ones who have the power 
to uh, step in and start making changes in their organizations and the community at large. So right now is a great time to be learning more about these issues. And I'm going to give a huge shout out to Encompass as a place for people to start. Um, EncompassMovement.org. They're an organization that tries to increase effectiveness in the animal protection movement, but specifically by fostering greater racial diversity, equity, and inclusion by empowering advocates of color. And they have a fantastic blog. They have a fact page for if you feel like you have a lot of questions about why this is important, where to start. Um, and they are even offering webinars right now about how white vegans, for instance, can help make change. Awesome. So it's it's just really important to remember that the marginalized advocates themselves are not the people responsible for making these changes. That is up to us privileged people to take that action, take responsibility, and make changes within ourselves, within our own organizations, and the people around us. Yeah, we absolutely have to be able to accept our own privilege in these situations. Um, and I'll ask, I don't know if there, there's any information on this, did you experience any pushback on that kind of questioning or that part of the survey from advocates when it was asked? Not on the survey. Um, I think that there is a little bit of surprise from some advocates that the percentages are as high as they are. Mm. I personally, despite my privileged status, am not surprised. Yeah. Um, it being over a five-year period, I think it's honestly, it could be higher than 50% of advocates who have experienced some form of discrimination or harassment. Like you said, I don't know if things like posting something online and getting told off, I don't know if that's coming to mind for most people. Yeah. If, if it were, maybe it would be higher. But so I'm not sure that it's deliberate or explicit pushback, but I think that there's a lot of defensiveness from people about these issues and they're in some cases having trouble accepting that yes um and it's hard i will say that uh for myself as i learned about this stuff over time sometimes mm -hmm. it is a very difficult conversation to listen to and accept but once you do once you start to learn uh the opportunity to learn and grow becomes endless and that is a, a nice feeling to at least be able to try and be part of the solution rather than a part of the whether intentional or unconscious problem. Um, exactly. I, the, the biggest thing that I've taken away from my own uh, look into diversity, equity, inclusion is just embracing the discomfort mm -hmm. that these things are not comfortable to think about or to try to change. And I think a lot of the time, it's really tempting to see that discomfort as a feeling that you're doing something wrong and that you should stop. Um, and you have to override that reaction and just, you know, push through and recognize that discomfort means you're doing it right. Yes. And you need to keep doing it. Yes. And sitting in discomfort is difficult. I was part of a generalized anxiety workshop where one of the goals was to sit in discomfort together for two minutes. And we all had to do something we were uncomfortable with. It was really wildly uncomfortable experience, but also somewhat motivating. Um, I, I sat with my back to that. the room. Oh, interesting. Yeah. It did not go well. <laughs> I love that though. And and full disclosure, I, I experienced generalized anxiety disorder myself. Mm -hmm. And I think I used that as an excuse for a time that discomfort is not something that it's okay for me personally to experience. And therefore I am allowed to not think about these issues. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I, that's part of my personal journey, learning to overcome that excuse and, you know, find the ways that I can sit with the discomfort in a way that's not going to be dangerous to my mental health. Yes. That there yes. is a balance to be found there. It doesn't mean push through every kind of discomfort and ignore the fact that you have a mental health issue that you need to work with, but don't, you know, I try not to, to take it as something that I'm leaning on when I don't need to. Absolutely. I, I mean, it has been such a huge part of my life um, throughout my life and has 
when I have allowed it to take over my life, it typically results in bad things. When I try and push through, it results in good things. That being said, I'm still not jumping in the water with sharks. I know the stats. I've seen all of the documentaries. I know it's quote unquote safe. It's not for me. It's just not happening. So that's discomfort. I'm comfortable not sitting in just for context in case anyone was wondering. (laughs) good context same Thanks. here okay. and, and you know if you i do want to say for anyone else who's listening who also experiences whatever kind of mental health issue or other kind of marginalized status that interacts with this kind of thing is that there are areas where that is going to change the way you can relate to racial diversity or other forms of equity in the movement and that's okay you need to think about your own mental health and everything else at the same time. And it's a really tricky balance to find. Absolutely. Uh, I am a fan of the self-care analogy of being on an airplane and putting on your own mask before putting on someone else's too. Yes. Um, Perfect. Because you can't help others if you can't help yourself. Um, And my final question, well, I guess I had two. One I think we've maybe already covered was your biggest surprises from the study as someone in the industry, who is studying the industry, what was the thing that jumped out at you the most? This is this is a boring answer, but <laughs> I I wasn't too surprised by any of the findings myself. Um, I come from a background of studying retention and turnover in other contexts, okay. and I also come from a background of human psychology. So my surprise is maybe not the most important thing. Ah. Leadership is crucial. Treating people fairly is crucial. And understanding that although animal advocates put the animals first, the non-human animals first, humans are animals too. And we need to think of each other and the things that we need in order to function well as people first and as advocates. And so maybe that wasn't surprising to me. I don't want to speculate whether it's surprising to others, but I hope that it will be taken to heart to remember the people you're working with as people themselves are so important. And that's kind of my final question was, how can we be better to each other? But you answered that out of order. So now I, I've i got nothing to close on and we're just going to sit in awkwardness until people turn off the podcast. <laughs> That, that sounds great, but I will say, <laughs> um, just, you know, think about social justice issues, actively look into them to get a better understanding because they interact with justice for animals. You're not choosing one over the other. It's This isn't a zero-sum game that we're in here. It all goes together hand in hand, and we're stronger as a community when we treat each other like a community and like friends. To read the full report and explore the data in depth, head over to faunalytics.org. That's F-A-U-N-A-L-Y-T-I-C-S dot org. I really want to thank Dr. Anderson for joining the show. I had a great time chatting with Joe, and I truly appreciate all the work the Faunalytics team does for the animals and for the advocates. Of course, I want to thank all of you, dear listeners, too. And that's why I'm giving away a gator. These are the double-lined face masks enjoyed often by runners for their diversity in wear. I'm personally loving my bear face mask. Check out Defender Radio on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook to see a pic. It's way more convenient for me with my large head and goofy ears than any elastic bands have been so far, and I keep getting compliments from animal lovers. So here's the plan. Post about your favorite episode of Defender Radio with a link to the episode and send me a screenshot. If you live in the U.S. or Canada, you'll automatically be entered for a chance to win a gator of your choice. We have bear, cougar, and beaver styles available from our third-party supplier. So share your favorite episode, send me a screenshot, and your contact info to info at thefurbears.com or via any social channel, and you could win. Links and details are in this week's show notes and at thefurbears.com. That's it for this week, folks. Thank you so much for listening, sharing, and rating the show. It helps more people find Defender Radio and gets these messages out to an even bigger audience. Until next time, I'm Michael Howie for Defender Radio and the Fur Bears, reminding you to be kind and to stay informed and stay strong. <laughs> <laughs>